Well, hello there. Fancy meeting you here. Actually, it's not that surprising. You just hit play, so of course you're here. And I'm here. And this is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. If you are newly stumbling upon the show, maybe a friend of yours told you about it and you're checking it out, Let me express some welcoming sentiments to you. And let me mention that I am just going to have a little check-in with regular listeners here before we talk to today's guest, Lauren Walker. Some people appreciate that I do that sometimes. Some people not so much. If you are the latter, do please feel welcome to skip ahead. I will not be the least bit offended. If you're sticking around, what's up? How is everybody doing? How's it going? Are you settled in? I know a lot of you, there's usually a little bit of a a settling in in some regards in order to listen to this. Either you're just settling into the car ride on your way to class, or maybe you're settling into the walk that you're having Or maybe you're my friend Terry and you're with your cat and you're settling into bed. But there's often a sort of settling in. And, oh, I really enjoy the idea that there's someone out there, you, who is settling in in this moment. I do want to say something today about this blog post I wrote. I don't know if you saw it. If not, you might go read it. It's called... Yoga is not convenient. And it comes out of me looking ahead towards 2020 and thinking about what I'm going to do or what I need to do as a yoga teacher and trying to once again navigate what I really want to do, what I feel like my passion is telling me to do, and you know, the industry dictates like the things that you do because you need to, to make the money that your life is requiring, you know, to meet your financial needs. I don't want to get into numbers this week. I've done that in the past, as some of you may remember, but I'm now looking ahead. And if you are someone, a yoga teacher who travels to make your living, if you do a lot of Uh, away gigs, then you have to think ahead. So we're already halfway through 2019. You got to be thinking about 2020 already. And really, there's only kind of two options these days. You're either doing teacher training, which is really where everybody seems to be making their money, Or you're sometimes doing workshops that are for teacher trainings, or maybe you do modules for other people's teacher training, but it it has to say teacher training on it. And if it says teacher training on it, then it's worth thousands of dollars. And that's why people are able to make their money, because people are willing to pay more when it says specifically teacher training on there. Anything else that you might offer is not worth thousands, it's worth like hundreds. And then it's a matter of coming up with titles and descriptions that will help get people in the door. And, you know, when you do that, when you write a title or description and that's what gets people in the door, teachers then have to try to fulfill that expectation. They have to try to give you what it said in the title and description. And really, the impression it gives is that yoga teachers teach lots of different things. And I really don't think that's true. I think yoga teachers present different aspects of what they know and then call it different titles and descriptions as though they teach lots of different things. But really, yoga teachers don't teach lots of different things. They teach yoga. And 
I think that when someone comes expecting to get what the title and description says, it's a very different dynamic than if someone comes because they're interested in this teacher and an opportunity to have that teacher be like an outside reference for their inquiry. And not only is the dynamic different in terms of like the yogic learning relationship, but it's different in terms of the money. And I've talked about this in the past, like the difference between an exchange of value where you're valuing the space and time that this teacher is sort of holding for us to have practice and you're willing to pay for that as opposed to teachers developing content as a luxury commodity. And if you have the money and the time to dispose, then you are then going to have access to it. And then you can gain this knowledge that the teachers have. And I just, I don't think that's how it works. And I'm really interested in how can we change this dynamic? How can we make yoga less about a commodity? Of course, there's always going to be like a service and a fee. We're still going to charge money and pay money. It's just how we think about it. And again, the dynamic and the feeling that you have in the taking of the money and in the giving of the money. And when we do stuff and write titles and descriptions because they work, it, it undermines that, the, the evolution that we could potentially have. And, you know, I was talking about this at a workshop recently when I was traveling, and somebody wrote me a really lovely email, and it was basically a little bit critical, saying, well, you know, it sounds like a scarcity mentality in what you're saying, like there's not enough. And I didn't think about that. Maybe I am. Maybe I am feeling too much fear and then that's, you know, seeping out and I'm just being very creative about hiding it and I am kind of coming from this feeling of like, oh no, it's not enough. But I I don't think so. I don't feel that. I know that it's enough. I know that on some level, philosophically, if you were listening last week to my conversation with Chase Bossart, on some level, I know it doesn't even matter really. But in myself, I feel that it's possible. I believe it's possible. I know it's possible. Because that I have even been able to, I don't know, make it for as long as I had doing what I'm doing is a complete impossibility. It's definitely possible for us to create new precedents. But it's going to take more than just me. (laughs) It's going to be a lot of us who are willing to, as Chase was saying last week, perceive the situation clearly and make the choices that would provide us examples of new directions. And I know that's a little bit vague, but I don't know how to be more specific. It's going to mean different things to different people. So I don't know if that means anything to anybody else, but... It's really been on my brain, and it's, it's what I was trying to get out in that blog post to, I don't know how much of a successful degree or not, but you can go read it. It's called Yoga is Not Convenient, and I always love hearing what you think, so please do feel welcome to send me an email telling me as much. And... It is totally pertinent to today's talk with Lauren Walker, this idea of possibility and of getting past some arbitrary boundaries that I think have been set on our perceptions of what's happening in not only our bodies, but in the world around us. Lauren is a practitioner of energy medicine and energy medicine yoga, And I had not spoken to her before this, but our lives have paralleled quite a bit, as you will learn. And she and I are both doing this sort of traveling thing together. I'm on my way to Omega tomorrow, and I'll be seeing her in passing. I'm arriving as she's leaving. 
And then in August, I'm going to be at the Feathered Pipe Ranch, and it's going to be the other way around. I'm going to be leaving as she's arriving. We're just like two ships. And that has happened in the past, we learned as well, many, many, many years ago as well. So it was lovely to have an opportunity to connect with her and to really get into some areas that I haven't gotten into so much before, some areas that I have, I think, my own baggage around. And this conversation was very, very helpful. It really got me thinking about a lot of things. I'm very excited for you to hear it today. Before we do, let me mention that today's episode is sponsored by yogicstudies.com. And if you've been listening, then you've heard me talk about Yogic Studies It is an invaluable resource for expanding your knowledge base around yoga. Seth Powell, the founder of Yogic Studies, has been on the show before. I encourage you to go back and listen to the episode. Seth is a wonderful teacher. I have taken his History and Philosophies of Yoga course, and as we discussed, I learned a lot from it. Seth is skilled at making things that are often unaccessible more digestible to everyone. And what he's teaching, history and philosophies of yoga, Sanskrit, I believe he's got a Gita course now, he's got a couple of new offerings. It's really great stuff. And as a listener of the show, you can get a discount. If you use promo code JBrown15, all capital letters, you got to make sure it's all capital letters, JBrown15, you can get 15% off. That's promo code JBrown15, all capital letters, for 15% off. Go to yogicstudies.com. Also, let me tell you where I'm going to be so that if you're around, you could come and we could meet in person. I think that would be lovely. I'm going to be in Carlisle, Pennsylvania at Anahata Yoga on June 29th. I am going to be at the Lehigh Valley Yoga Festival July 13th. And I'm going to be at the Feather Pipe Ranch in Helena, Montana, August 17th through the 24th. You can find out about those gigs and more and learn about all of my stuff at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, let me also mention that next week, Nishala Devi is going to be here. And I have been mentioning it because I'm excited about it. It's a very cool talk. That will be next week. I will say a little bit more about it on the other side, as well as a few other things, but I think that will do it for now, my friends. Let's go ahead and get to this conversation that I had with Lauren Walker. Hello? Hello. Hey, Lauren. Hi, how are you? Doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Oh, here we are today. Where are you in the world right now? I am in Montana. Oh, how far away are you from the feathered pipe? I live about it's about six hours or so, uh, five or six. Yeah. Yeah, nothing's all that close in Montana. It seems like. <laughs> no, nothing <laughs> is close at all. <laughs> it's real spread out, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Have you been here before to the Feathered Pipe before? I have. I've been there two other times. And nice. I did last time drive from there <gasps> to my friends in Ohio and my sister in, outside of Portland. So I, I did like a whole road trip and really got to see it more. Wow. Nice. Uh, I thought you were going to say you drove from New York. <laughs> no, 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 no. We flew to Montana and then we drove around over there and then we flew back. Nice, nice. But, um, yeah, so, okay, so you're in Montana. What's the weather like there today? Is it nice out? It's gorgeous. It rained all night, which is always lovely. We can never get too much rain. And um, now it's sunny and beautiful and uh, a a warm spring day. That's nice. Mm, It's been raining on the East Coast, though, I hear. It has been. It's been raining an awful lot. So today the sun came out, which is a nice thing. Nice. Uh, but I have to say, there's, as I've traveled around the world over the last two years, I've really noticed that different places have their own inherent kind of feeling or quality to them. 
Mm-hmm. Like if you just go outside out of place and close your eyes and just try to take in how it feels to stand there with your eyes closed. Mm. Different places, I think they have different feeling to them. Different mm-hmm. kind of like a vibratory quality, if you will. I like that, and, yeah. And Montana, I did spend some time there. It, it has a very expansive quality. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that. And from coming from the East Coast, having grown up there, uh, I just feel it so markedly, just the the vastness of it, that it, can, it holds you in a different way. It's not like the nestled in-ness of like Vermont, um, but it, it holds you in a different way, which I... I guess I need because I keep coming back here and now I'm definitely not ever going anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's interesting. You can talk mm-hmm. about that. Well, you know, when I was there, not this last time, last time I took my family and that was really fun. But the time before I had a moment that really struck me where I was walking around the feather pipe and there's a point where you, you hit the edge of where their property is. And then the mm-hmm. other side of that is just like, open, raw nature, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's like a sign there, like a warning sign, <laughs> like beyond this point. And I hit that point and I, I got scared. I was like, wow, mm-hmm. I can't go in there. Mm-hmm. Like I'm like a suburb boy who moved to the big city. <laughs> I would die. I could, I could take care of my, you know, it was like, wow, like raw nature like that. Mm-hmm. It's not something it- I've really gotten to experience in that raw kind of way, really. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, it's not something to mess around with. I mean, just walking, I live on a dead end dirt road and just walking up and down the road there uh, the other day were huge bear prints up and down the road. And I mean, I carry my bear sprays just to, you know, walk the dog down the road, let alone when I'm walking in in the woods and I'm seeing cat prints and cat scat. And by cat, I don't mean little kittens. I mean like (laughs) big mountain lions and, you know, so um, it's definitely, uh, yeah, it's nothing to be messed around with. No, I felt definitely like out of my league. (laughs) (laughs) Not not without some better mentors and training, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, and there's really, I mean, you, you get training and all of that and, but it's still, you need to have a healthy, uh, a healthy, it's not even a dose of fear, respect, um, for your environment and know when to turn back and know, um, because, you know, people die all the time on the mountain and the, in, you know, in, I say the mountain, I mean the ski hill and in Glacier Park. And, you know, my, um, my fiance works in Glacier and just yesterday they did a whole search and rescue training mission. And the day before they did a bear safety, a whole day on that. And tomorrow they're doing, um, a rapid water rescue, like river rescues. And, you know, it's like, and that's not even their main job, but they have to all be trained up in it and they retrain every year. And, you know, just in case, because shit happens. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah and when shit happens there, you, you're far away from anywhere else. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're far away. The consequences are, are real. And yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's it's life or death, but you know, it's also magnificent and amazing. So, and you know, it's I mean, it's or the risk is for an, anyone for sure, but there's also I mean, just between you and me, there's some just stupid things that happen. And you know, you see it on the internet, like th- taking a selfie, took a step back and fell off a 50-foot cliff. Like <laughs> that happens probably three or four times in Glacier Park every year. And you're just like, seriously? <laughs> you stepped over the guardrail to take that picture because you needed like one extra inch for the mountain that's like, you know, <laughs> already 100 feet away from you. That wasn't the smartest thing you could have done, clearly, because it was yeah. the last thing you did. <laughs> yeah, that's, so. that's just human error. That's not nature's yeah. raw power. That's no. human stupidity. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Which is much more massive. <laughs> that's true. And yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me also say, Lauren, you know, I think I said in an email, let me apologize. This has taken so long to happen. It's okay. <laughs> when I saw, like, as I mentioned, you know, I think your email came at a particular time when I was like swamped and I had these like little folders that I throw things in. And I accidentally put yours into the wrong folder. And then when I found it, I was like, oh, gosh. And then I was looking, and I was like, wait a second. Because 
our lives are paralleling. I in, know. In like a myriad <laughs> of ways. When I like, yeah. when I like grabbed it, I was like, wait, Lauren Walker, I've heard her name. And then I've heard of this energy medicine thing before. And then like, I went to your website and you have a really good bio. It like lays out your story some, which is like super, <laughs> which is really great for people who want to know about you. <laughs> I've gotten some jokes about that, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> really? No, I think it's good. I don't know if anybody gave you crap about it because to me, I did, I did learn a bunch of things, which I, mm-hmm. and then all these like bells went off. Cause I was like, Whoa, wait a second, wait a second. So, <laughs> I mean, first of all, we both went to Tish. We both went to Tish school of the arts. I know that's crazy. I was in circle in the square. How about you? Oh, okay. No, I started at playwrights horizons. Oh, nice. And then after two years, I transferred to ETW to the experimental theater wing. Oh, very I, cool. I grew weary of the Stanislavski. Mm-hmm. Mm. I grew weary and I actually almost put this in my email to you, but then I thought, oh no, then he's going to want to have this be what we talk about in the interview. And I don't want to talk about <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. Good thinking. I, I had a me too um, moment at NYU. Uh. And um, so I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm good with the acting thing. And I went to, uh, ended up graduating from Gallatin with uh, um, a degree in creative writing and English literature, because I was like, I am never going to put myself in that position in front of of the camera or people again and of course I have in the yoga world and they have their own me too issues I thankfully avoided the me too in the yoga community although I saw it happen a lot mm. but um I definitely had my me too Hollywood moment where I was like yep that's not for me so oh wow well I know mm. I mean that's very interesting because I know for me the acting training acting training had a really good ability to break me down because I was really not I was really uh, had all these stuff around me and I wasn't feeling things. So it made me feel things and be more mm-hmm. accessible, nice. but, it, but it didn't do anything to build me up at all. You know, and it was all kinds of reckless stuff we did, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I could see, did that happen at circle in the square? Um, you know, did they build us up? I probably didn't stay in the program long enough. Maybe they built you up at some point. It was really, you know, I was in the the training part of it. And so it really, I don't feel so much broken down. And there were, there's tools that I still use today. Mm. I definitely feel like it was supporting a deeper exploration that, you know, yoga only continued. So I I didn't feel broken down. Um, Oh, I meant, I meant, did your Me Too situation happen there? Oh, it, you know, it did. I was, um, I was, uh, asked to be in a a national ad campaign by the uh, chancellor of the school. And I did this photo shoot with some, he's a very famous photographer. And, uh, we did this photo shoot. It was great. It was supposed to run in Newsweek and time and all these things. It had the same program that Isabella Rossellini had just been in. I was like, Oh my God, you know, like all the bells and whistles and whatever. And then he invited me down to his private studio to do a photo shoot. Oh my God, you're so beautiful, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I'm a kid. I don't know anything. And so I go down to his photo studio. Have you ever seen the movie Fame? Yes. I'm not even kidding you that it was like the exact, exact same scene, like the exact scene when Irene Cara is with the, the, uh, on the, in the audition and, um, except it went even a little worse than that. And, uh, I just left his studio and I was like, yep, I don't need ever to put myself in that position where I'm with a photographer or a videographer or a director or any of that. I was just like, I'm good. I'm going to go crawl under a rock with a book for the rest of my life. <laughs> so um, that's what I did for a long time. Not forever, but well, yeah. sorry about that. Sucks. Yeah, it did kind of suck. But you know, at the same time, I think it was instructive because I wasn't strong enough. Had I become an actress, I would have been one of those ones um, that had been, you know, completely uh, me too. You know, Weinstein or whatever they're calling it now, because I, I wouldn't have had the the self awareness, the self knowledge, the inner strength. None of that, and so. Um, you know, it, it was it was maybe God saying, you know what, you don't really want to do that. And, you know, I don't know, you probably know a lot of actors. I just feel like the yogic path was so much more valuable for me as a human being than... Oh, I relate to that. I, you know, I, for me, I came up against it once it got to the point where it was a profession. Like, I did it in high school, 
I, I was very comfortable on stage. I won like some contests, you know, some awards mm-hmm. for scenes. And then in school, you know, I had all kinds of stuff to do with my mom had died, you know, and it, mm-hmm. it very quickly became more about that than being a good actor. And my teachers didn't even like me very much, you know, cause I just, <laughs> I had so much shit to deal with. And then ultimately once it became about going on auditions and dealing with the industry, I was like, fuck this. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, and so, but it is interesting what you say about the tools because it's funny, you know, those speech classes, I'm sure you might've had to take it when they go, pa, 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 ba, 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 da, 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 you know, those speech classes. <laughs> yeah. I remember yeah. freshman year, like being such a jerk and going into the administration and telling them that it was a waste of my time. I didn't need these classes. And, <laughs> and, you know, now when I'm talking to like a big room of people, I'm totally using that stuff, you know. That is so <laughs> I have to I have to tell you. Oh my God, it's so funny. I've got to see if I have a copy of my book. Let's see if I can grab it. Um, there is uh, an exercise that I learned in my speech class that I included in the book hmm. because it's so valuable. It's about loosening the jaw and releasing excess tension. And now, what I know about understanding, um, you know, how the body and and specifically how trauma works in the body, that's a, a movement that I include in. All, many classes. Is it the jaw shaking thing where you it shake is, your jaw, you like hold your jaw and yeah. you shake it up yeah. and down? Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. It came right from my acting class. <laughs> yes. That's so funny. You know, I haven't done that forever. I got to do that. I'm going to do it right now. I, 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 I remember you make the sound. I, 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 yeah. I just wrote a video. Of it. I, wow. like, I know you might feel silly, but it's so good for you. That no, it's all coming back yeah. to me. That is a good yeah. thing because you hold so much in your jaw. That's true. Yeah, wow, that's, that's so weird. funny. <laughs> but yeah. but we both ended up moving in a different direction. And you, what did you say? You you left, and where did you go? I um, you know, I was offered a um, a full scholarship to do a master's program in um, publishing, and I had to, my senior year. I went on a ski trip to Utah, and I learned how to snowboard. Mm. And I almost dropped out of college, like spring semester senior year. And I was hooked on the the mountains and on skiing and snowboarding. And so I left New York in a VW bug and I drove all around the country and ended up here in Montana and um, was a ski bum for a couple years, cocktail waitress. And interesting that you said that your mom died when you were young. My dad died the year after I graduated college. And that is what threw me on the spiritual path. And so I ended up traveling all over the world and sort of seeking like what is the meaning of anything and found yoga, found Reiki and rebirthing and, you know, just fire walking. Like I did everything. <laughs> well, I want to go back to snowboarding. Cause that's the first <laughs> one you said, what was it about snowboarding that you liked so much? Why do you think you got so into snowboarding of all things? Yeah, you know, it was, uh, have you ever snowboarded? And I have. And you know, yeah. it's funny. <laughs> I just, I'll never forget snowboarding because that first time I went out, I bailed super hard and hurt my shoulder. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I learned, I basically figured it out though. Yeah. And then after that, I could, I snowboarded and I was fine. I didn't hurt myself, but I still sometimes feel that shoulder injury. Mm, and yep, I go snowboarding. Yep. You got to earn it with snowboarding in a way. Like earn- if you can get past that initial thing where you get slammed a couple times, you don't mm-hmm. get slammed too hard, you don't get hurt too bad. And then you figure out how to cut those, those lines or whatever you, yeah. then it's fun. I wouldn't ski again. I would always snowboard now. Well, that's I was, I was a skateboarder in high school too, but oh, okay. That's it. That's the hook. Yeah. So I have a sense of why you might, but I also stopped skateboarding and did stuff cause I got scared. And if you're scared, you're not good, you know? Yep. No, it's true. <laughs> and it's funny cause I snowboarded for years. Um, I even raced a little, went to New Zealand to train and, but then I, um, I took a, a break from that a few years ago. And um, when I came back to Montana, I picked up skiing and um, I would never go back to snowboarding now. Mm. I love skiing so much. It's just the, the, the freedom and the, I mean, the, the fun factor is just so high, but also the skill factor and you're constantly like working and learning and all of these moving parts together. And then you're in the mountains and it's exquisitely beautiful, especially if you do any backcountry where you're away from the crowds and the lifts and you're just you and the mountains and 
the snow. Uh, snow is my favorite substance on earth. I just, mm. I just love it. So I don't know. It hooked me back then and it just has not, it's only gotten stronger. So that's what it was. It was just the snow. Like, was there anything specific about snowboarding at the time? I just said that's an interesting choice. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, I was, I had been a dancer and, you know, like, you know, in New York, you're doing tap and jazz and ballet and like all of this stuff for acting and, you know, all that kind of body movement in that way. And, um, and this was just a completely different way of moving that once you got past that slamming factor, you know, it was, it's like easeful joy. It's like floating or flying or, I mean, it's hard to describe if you haven't done it and you have, you know, the, the absolute, um, it's like an otherworldly experience in your body. You're literally flying on a substance, um, with gravity as your partner. It's, it's, I think it's the closest thing you can come to flying. That's what I think it is. Um, it yeah. does have its own feeling when you go down a mountain like that. Mm-hmm. Back and, and, then on, and, and when you're in a storm, that's my favorite storm skiing. When it's like you are just surrounded by this, by water, basically. You are like completely immersed in another, um, in another substance versus like the regular gravity of just walking on the earth in the air. You know, you are like, it's like almost underwater. It's, mm. I don't know. I just find it magical. All right, so you go gallivanting around, <laughs> snowboarding to New Zealand and Montana. Mm-hmm. I got another note here that said you sold chocolate in Ecuador. What's that about? Yeah, that was part of my like wandering all over the planet. And I, I almost wanted to put in there like it wasn't pot chocolate because, you know, like <laughs> people think, you know, oh, she must have been. But it wasn't. I would just, I, um, I found this woman who had a ran, ran a restaurant and she wasn't using the cafe during the day and she let me come in and I baked my mom's brownie recipe and nobody had ever had brownies before in this little town it was called Banos you blew their restaurant. minds with your mom's I brownie blew recipe with their- I would go and stand outside the churches where all the little old ladies were selling candles and they would be like calling me to come over and like buy my, I would sell out every single day. Nice. And uh, yeah, it was just hilarious. So huh. I did all those, you know, when you're traveling and you just need to make a few bucks and I was living in Banos for a little bit of time. So I thought, well, you know, what can I do to make some money? And that's what I did. All right. And <laughs> in those travels, like, did you, I don't know what, 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 in your mind, were you, were you searching for something? Were you just exploring? Do you, because, you know, I didn't travel until later. I mean, I did a little bit of travel, but you, you kind of took off and went all over. Yeah, well, you know, after, it was really after my, after my father died, mm-hmm. and it was really I'm sorry, just, what, what year was that when your dad died? It was, gosh, God, let me look back now, 93. Okay. Was it 93 or 92 or 91? It was 92 or 3. And when um, were you in school at NYU? I graduated in 91 or 92. Oh, oh my okay. God, that's I, horrible. That I, can't, I, I, should I got there in 90 and graduated in 94. So we passed each other back we then. We the night. Just we did. like now. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, so after he died, I was really – I was. Um, Living here, uh, living actually on the ski mountain in a very not good relationship. And it was just like, what is my life? Like, what is going on? What is the meaning of anything? And I remember um, yeah, just being really depressed and miserable, um, crying a lot. At one point, I just remember sitting inside a closet and just crying. I might have been, maybe I had been cleaning it out. I'd like to think I was cleaning it out as opposed to just like torturing myself in a closet, but um, just feeling just completely untethered. And um, for some reason, my dad had given me a little catalog, like they had, he had gotten on a plane trip of New Zealand and the pictures were so beautiful. And we had joked about that there are more sheep than people and I don't know what it was, but I thought, okay, I'm going to go there. And I, it was winter there, so uh, which is obviously, or not, but it is my favorite season. And so I just, I bought a plane ticket and I went. And what's so interesting to me, looking back on it, you know, you fly over to New Zealand and you cross the international date line. So I left the United States on July 20th and I got to New Zealand on July 22nd. And I had completely skipped 
my dad's birthday, which is July 21st. And that was the first year that he had been, um, he had died the previous December. And I thought, well, that's interesting. It took me a while to even realize that. Mm. Um, and that was where I first um, kind of landed on my spiritual path. I was really raw at that point. You know, he'd only been dead a few months and he had been really young. He was 49 years old. He died of a double brain aneurysm. It was horrible, really awful, awful event. And, um, and I was just, you know, searching and seeking, but I'm, I'm not sure how conscious that was, but I just knew I was raw. And I landed in this, um, eventually, in this little town on the South Island, it's not so little anymore, called Wanaka. And um, I, I just fell in with this group of New Agers. <laughs> they used to call themselves New Age wankers, you know. I don't even know. It was just quite <laughs> funny, right? But um, I just fell in with them. And there was a little, uh, it was a little cafe herb shop again not not pot herbs or actual medicinal herbs and massage place and it was called the center at c-e-n-t-r-e of course that's how they spell stuff over there the center of the universe is what they called it and it really kind of became that for me and i i took an astrology class there i learned i did rebirthing we did meditations i was introduced to um to energy work um all kinds of we did i did a fire walk over there twice so i walked across hot coals I mean, I had never heard of any of this stuff. And um, Mm. it really just was a a healing, incredibly beautiful community of people. Um, Just a different speed of life back then, you know, hanging out on the picnic table in front of this, the center of the universe all day long and, you know, drinking coffee and, you know, just talking about life. And um, it was just a really beautiful healing time. And, And in New Zealand, you can ski in the mornings and come down and it's warm in the afternoons down, you know, because the ski hills are so high up. So I was there for maybe six or eight, maybe even 10 months and um, kind of came back and forth to Montana, but then just continued traveling, spent a lot of time in Central and South America. And um, I think it was, it was in 96, uh, the fall of 96, that I ended up back in New York City and uh, Walked into Jiva Mukti. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. Well, you know, first, just to say, New Zealand has its own quality to it as well. In fact, right now, I'm wearing a Punamu stone, which I've been wearing since I went there for the first time. Like, nice. I feel that place has like a real powerful energy to it. Mm-hmm. And I got to hang out with Donna Fari, and she gave me this beautiful mm-hmm. necklace. And I just feel like I've always had a thing for green stone, even before I went to mm-hmm. New Zealand, and then. I don't know. I just like the way it feels. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, they have pieces of a feeling to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certain healing qualities even to them sometimes. Abs- uh, New Zealand, absolutely. For me was, you know, it, it really put me on my spiritual path. I say my dad's death put me on my spiritual path, but, um, but that brought me right to New Zealand, which was, it, it couldn't have been more perfect um, just because of the, the mix of culture and, um, just the different, it's just a different way of life over there. Uh, mm. It's hard to describe. It's just, and it may be changed now, but it was just such a slower, more integrated community way of life that um, I just, if it wasn't so far away, I might have stayed. But, you know, it's hard to have a have your family be, you know, 24-hour plane ride away. <laughs> well, they also, they also don't really have that same kind of thing in New York City. I mean, Little little bubbles, though, you see? That's, I guess, what Jiva was, right? Mm-hmm. It's like a little well, bubble. You know, bu- well, why did, you go to, why did you go to New York? What made you go back there? Yeah, so, okay, so then I, I was traveling Central South America and got really, really sick eventually and uh, came back to and lived in my mom's house in Maine for a while, just like, I mean, you know, I had the stomach hitchhikers, but in a really bad way for a while, and I was just, you know, basically sick in the, the little cabin in the back, and... I had been writing a novel the whole time I'd been in South America, and so I was starting to transcribe that because I wrote the whole thing in um, longhand. They didn't have a computer with me or anything, and so I was starting to transcribe that. And a friend of mine, an act- actually an actor friend of mine, uh, had a house or a an apartment in the East Village that had this weird little cabin in the back. So it had this little back deck that you walked out of the kitchen onto. And then around the corner from that was this little, they cobbled together this little room. It was an enclosed room. It was literally the size of a futon bed 
laid out and then maybe three more feet. So it was tiny. Mm. Um, but she's like, if you want to come here and, uh, you know, and work on your book, I've got a room for you. And who has a room in the East what? Village? You know what where, I mean? Where so, was it in the East Village? Do you... It was on 4th Street between... One and A, I think. Oh my gosh. gosh you're really working on me to get my No, I, I lived on up. Clinton and Stanton for years. I lived on okay. St. Mark's at 8th and A. I mean, that was my stomping grounds back yeah. when it was okay. like affordable to live there. I had an apartment yeah. for like $450 a month. It was like in a exactly. basement. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's the kind of thing. And she probably was probably the same and she wanted help with that that little rent. So I've moved in and you know, why not? I'd been living in Maine, which was lovely, but also um very isolating. I, you know, I'd been there in the in the summer, but now it was coming fall and um you know, there's it's a tourist town, so it kind of emptied out and I was just I needed to be around people and she was my best friend from um from college. So I moved in and you know, I'm not a runner. And so if you don't run, it's not a lot of things you can do for exercise in New York. And she gave me this flyer for yoga. And I thought, oh my God, yoga, that's so boring. That's for old ladies. What are you talking about? And uh, she's like, I don't know. It looked kind of cool. It didn't really look old lady like. And I was like, all right, whatever. I'll check it out. No, Jiva was hit, man. (laughs) 96, Jiva was jumping on second Jiva avenue was jumping and it was yeah. also just sort of getting started too at the same time you know mm. so you know i walked in i took my first class there with adrian and- adrian wow yeah. mine was yeah. kachi who's been on the uh, show before yeah yep yeah, yep yeah. i took a lot of classes with her too but adrian was my first and uh mm. you know it was an open level class i thought all right that means anyone so i walk in the whole mm. class is in sanskrit which of course if you don't know it you're like what is anybody saying people were busting up into headstands and handstands and I'm looking around I have no idea what I'm doing I have to like look at the person next to me to see what I'm supposed to do Mm. and it was it was like crazy and I was like out of my depth out of my league and at the same time something about it felt like I was coming home into my body for I want to say the first time and I just kept going back every single day I ended up you know, you got the, the all seasons pass or whatever it was called. And mm-hmm. um, back then classes were an hour and 45 minutes. That's right. And they timed those shavasanas for 15 minutes at least. Right. Exactly. And, and people least. would get squirmy after about 10 minutes and they just make you stay for five <laughs> more. And now we got sick. I just did a, taught a 60 minute class today. And so, you know, the shavasana was like, you know, maybe seven minutes. Like, yeah, if you're lucky and then forget about pranayama meditation, but you had that every class oh, at yeah. Jiva, every class there was um, always the, the nag shampoo was always burning and it just that place had such a infectious quality to it it was so cool the altars over the old fireplaces and um mm-hmm. and of course you know i took class from david every day twice a day so he was the guy that i ended up um studying with the most and i would take basically you know what is that three hours of class with david every day mm. um because I wasn't doing anything else. I was writing a book. That doesn't, you know, I would just come, take class, go home, have lunch, come back, take class. You know, I was a yeah. junkie. Yeah. And um, then I took a teacher training and, uh, you know, kind of. What, what teacher training did you do? I ended up doing um, a month-long immersion with integral yoga and okay. uh, went to Mexico for a month. And okay. um, the head of the ashram in New York City was my lead teacher. And as soon as we got back, he said, we got a slot for you. And I was like, I can't teach. I just took a 200 hour teacher training. He's like, you're ready. And he just put me on the schedule and he saw something in me that I didn't even know existed. And, um, I started teaching at integral and then eventually I moved back to Montana and took over. There was one woman teaching yoga at, uh, the Bohemian Grange hall, an old Grange hall, um, with like crooked floors and nails sticking out. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.